Hello, Matthew. Good evening, Ray. How are you? Well, sun kissed and feeling the, the start of summer. Isn't it lovely? Beautiful. Look at this side of my face there uh, in the <laughs> evening sun. <laughs> A hard day's work at your laptop with the sun on your face. Yeah. It. sunscreen on one side one side of my head um, yeah, you're like yeah. a bus driver a truck driver's arm you know just <laughs> on that one side That's it. Yeah. very good we have a, a we've got a huge audience this evening matt uh, and welcome to everyone already 600 steam coming in yeah. thick and fast welcome everybody and i, I I, I almost don't need to say it, but you're already participating in the chat section down there below, just saying hello and letting us know where you are, whereabouts in the UK. And if you've already opened a glass and, and uh, let us know and, and how your day was, so why not? You know, And any, any other sort of local updates from your area, stick it in the chat room. Absolutely. Uh, very good. So um, the numbers, we are... This has been recorded, so you can watch it back afterwards on the site, and it's also on Facebook. You might be watching this live on Facebook, but uh, we have six wines to take you through this evening. It is the crash course, and it will be reassuringly uh, reassuring in that there's it's very low key. We're just going to go through a lot of the basics, some things that just sort of take away any qualms or misunderstandings you may have had around wines, and so you feel just that little bit more confident whether you're shopping with us and or nobody else uh, or talking with friends, a barbecue or dinner party, just these little anecdotes, things to remember. That's the general gist of this evening. Yeah, it's getting back to basics, isn't it, Ray? It's, um, and actually, it's great. Very excited to, to be doing this again. We did something similar last year. It was just about our most popular session, I, I think. Um, so it's great to be doing it again. And the taste impact sold out very very quickly didn't they for this session so it's it's great to have everyone here uh, yeah so just yeah just get back to basics with with some wine and uh yeah talk about six you know iconic classic styles of wine and, and a few things that are you know make them the way they are i think that's it lots of signposting so you feel a bit more assured <laughs> and we make parallels to other wines so you know if you, whether you like these wines or not it will sort of it'll give you a bit more confidence when talking or thinking about other wines but all this talk of wine has me first thirsty matt and i could do with a glass myself so shall we kick off we've got that's great about 700 people already participating welcome um, so I'm going to do, as I have done before, uh, maybe just let us know in the chat there if, um, if this is your first tasting pack experience. And there'll be those who've done it before and they'll welcome and, and you know, steer you along. But I'm going to kick you off. This is great. Plenty of you are having your first time here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's great fun and it's very easy peasy. So then allow me to very simply give you a bit, it's a bit John and John, it's, it's Blue Peter style introduction into how to open these boxes so you don't spill wine anywhere. But so bear with me, allow me to sort of break it down quite simply. You see here on the corner, there's the perforated corner. You just pop it with your fingers like that. You hear that click and then you lift it up. And I know I'm spelling it out quite simply, but it's just safer that way. I'm gonna move this away from my laptop in case it uh, spills any wine. Not the best. Or they'll, they'll remove it from me. IT will take it away from me. And so then you clip it off. And I do the clip up around, fairly high up the clip, okay? You just clip it off in the corner. And then you go ahead and away from your laptop and your white carpet, you can pour it like that, okay? I know it, it is not rocket science, but sometimes, you know, it's a new innovative piece of work. So I just to share it with you like that. So we working for you there, Matt, you got it? Just about got it in the glass. Thanks, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big relief. It's our relief. So if everyone's with us, um, yeah, let's let's kick off. You, you're you welcome. You know, keep the chat going in the chat room. And then you have the Q&A. I see the already uh already a question in there and I'll, I'll i'll take this just as an example you can put a question in the q a question from tim do people try whites too cold there is tim such a thing as drinking some white wines too cold and i'll talk about that when we come on to the chardonnay 
Chardonnay is one wine where you don't want it too cold because you want it to be more expressive. Here we are with Pinot Grigio, and then next we'll have the Sauvignon Blanc. Those benefit from that nice, cool, crisp. They're there for refreshment, where Chardonnay can be a bit more expressive. So here, this is straight out of the fridge. Chardonnay, you can leave it a few minutes. Okay, so this first wine, there's two ways, two things I'd like to share with you. One is what this wine tastes like, uh, where else in the world you can find it. It's Pinot Grigio from Veneto, Northeast Italy. And, um, but then it's also, we wanna talk about how to taste. And it, you know, it's not to make too much of a big deal about it, but you see, let's say just taking as looking at Matt, he has his nose in the glass for a bit, it smells it twice and then he goes and has a drink. The idea is when you swirl a glass like this, the reason, you know, it looks a bit poncy and you see people in restaurants doing it. What we're actually doing is releasing the aroma, releasing the flavors of this wine, which has spent, you know, about two or three months in a glass bottle that has been put into these nice packages. And it's just been closed up and tightened. So by just doing that a couple of times safely, with not too much wine in the glass, otherwise it will go everywhere, you're just releasing the aromatics, opening it up. It's a bit like decanting, you know? The reason why you decant, one of the reasons you decant is just to put air through the red wine or white wine you're decanting. So that's why you do that, a little bit of a swirl. And then you have a smell. And the smell is to... One objective of smelling the wine is to see, is it faulty? So the wine might be corked. If it's corked, it smells a bit like damp paper, damp cardboard, a bit like wet dog. It basically, it's back to the old Neanderthal, you know, smell something, dead carcass, do not put in mouth if it doesn't smell good. That's how we sort of evolved. So it's not exactly the same motive. Does it smell, smell like a dead carcass? Exactly. And I do <laughs> not recommend you put it in your mouth. So you're just assessing it to go, okay, yeah. So that's, is it faulty? And second is like, what can I smell? What, what am I expecting to taste on the palate? That's why you smell it and then you taste it. So here you might get, it's Pinot Grigio is not, it's more towards a neutral grape variety. It's not very expressive. We move on to the Sauvignon Blanc afterwards. You'll see it's popping with different fruit flavors. Here, it's not pronounced in fruit flavors, but what you can smell is maybe white pear and white peach, that kind of thing. Matt, feel free to heckle, jump in with any other suggestions, but that's it. Mm. Nice and simple, clean fruit like that. Stone fruit, definitely stone fruit, isn't it? Like nectarine, maybe some flowers, sort of aromas of white flowers, I guess. Yeah. It's quite easy, just juicy fruit, but quite delicate. Yeah, I think exactly. that's Pinot Grigio in a nutshell, isn't it? That's it. <clears throat> and the other wines... There's perhaps even more to say about them. But here, Pinot Grigio is just one, sometimes just to take the ease off the day or to talk with friends where the conversation is more important than the wine you're drinking. Sometimes you could look at it that way. But then on the palate, you taste it. So I'll, I'll give you this sort of tip or steer on how to taste. And then it'll make more sense when, when we go to the next wine and Matt will talk to you about New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. It'll be more effective when you taste Matt's wine. But when you taste, you put it in your mouth, you see like Matt, you sort of, you're moving it around in your mouth a little bit. You feel it in your palate. So if you stick out your tongue, uh, you feel it on the side of your tongue. And that's where you feel acidity. And acidity is good. Acidity is not acid, like, but acidity is, it's a vibrancy, it's a Christmas, it's like citrus, you know, that's, it's, it's perkiness. So you want to have a little bit of citrus, a little bit of acidity, which you feel on the side of your mouth. You feel sweetness towards the front of your mouth. And then it's the overall sensation, you know, on your tongue and around how long is this flavor and sensation continuing? So you're, you're considering the length of the wine. That's sort of a measure of, of, of quality. But some wines are there not to be are not there to be assessed so much. They're just to be, you know, like a gin and tonic, just like a cold glass of water, just something refreshing. And I think this Pinot Grigio does that pretty much. So when we go on to the next, part one, of the appeal, isn't it? Sorry, Ray, it's part of the appeal. Of, I mean, that's I guess why. I mean, Pinot Grigio has got to be one of the most popular white varieties, if not the most popular. And there's a reason, isn't there? That it's just you don't have to think too hard. It's versatile. It's it's just maybe the start of an evening, the start of a meal. Not too high in alcohol. Not too challenging in flavors. Lots of great comments coming through about how easy and relaxing it is to enjoy. 
lots of some people sort of saying pink grapefruit. I like that mm. um, sort of character there for sure. Yeah. Um, great picnic wine. Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, this is this is absolute picnic picnic heaven. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. No. Well said. Nice descriptors. And then to echo those are you know what I, we talked about a bit of pear and white peach um, flower notes on the nose. Does does it follow through onto the palate? I would say so. Yes. A nice conference pair. You know, something you're just trying to. The reason why we talk about, uh, and you can talk about this as well on your on the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc map. But just the reason why we 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 look for descriptors is so that we can speak to someone else about what it tastes like because it's in our mouth and we're just trying to sort of translate what we're tasting to the next person. So that's why you see we communicate sometimes about blackberry fruit, raspberry, and you know, and here are pears. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. The very the very basics of wine tasting is look at it, smell it, taste it, and don't worry about it. Don't think too much about it. Do I like it? Yes or no? I think so. Um, and before we go on to the next one, Ray, um, uh, is it worth sort of, sort of saying about some of the other expressions of Pinot Grigio and other names for that grape variety? I mean, if, if this is a this is an Italian version, but um, what else might might our angels? Um, find in this variety so yeah exactly great it's um it's pinot gris the grape as well and uh and then it's just how it expresses itself in different regions and so you go let's say staying in europe up over the dolomites over the alps and we're up into france and then you've got alsace and you have an alsace pinot gris typically broader richer uh, a fuller wine in fact really doesn't resonate doesn't really reflect you you wouldn't identify mm -hmm. or put the two together but it's just about the climate the conditions where it grows so pinot gris from alsace is quite a distance away from pinot grigio from italy you go over to gerd step in germany and he's doing pinot gris he's a bit more in this profile it's light and it's vibrant so you got a crisp version of his is um yeah uh graubegunder they call it but pinot gris he calls it and then, of course, <clears throat> Angel's favorites down in New Zealand. And you've Rod Eastop's Pinot Gris, which is one of our best, you know, most loved wines. So it travels. It travels quite well. But I think Italy probably owned the crown in terms of widespread popularity. Mm. Um, and interesting to say, uh, just just before we finish with Pinot Gris, it, the, the, the grape actually has color in the skin doesn't it and um if you leave it in the on the vine a little bit longer to get some more sun uh it can go quite quite pink in color even before when you go and visit a pinot grigio vineyard or a pinot gris vineyard uh around sort of harvest time the, mm. the grapes some can quite often look, look mm. like red red grapes and um i'm sure lots of our our customers have had pinot grigio blush but Often that's 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 genuinely coming. That color is coming from the skins and not not from any addition of any red wine uh, in that in that variety at all. Yeah. So it's it's quite an unusual variety actually when you start to dig a bit deeper. Yeah, it does many things. And actually, Adrian and Rebecca Santlin in Australia, they uh, their boy meets girl Pinot Gris. Uh, it has a, a slight pink tint. So right. They decided to sort of go after what they believe that Alsatian style. But yeah, they that that Pinot Gris has a pink tint, so you can find that on the website if we have it here. Uh, and just before we move on, Matt, you know, a nice food pairing to go with this, or is it uh, you know a bowl of peanuts and you're sitting outside? <laughs> Do you know what? P nut, nuts are terrible with wine. Yeah, yeah. packet of crisps. It, it, that is a tip, actually, for, 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 well, we'll see. I mean, try it for yourself, but um, it is a known fact that nuts just kill the flavour of wine completely. So next time, give it a try. Taste, Have a bowl of salted peanuts, and I, I guarantee it will really mute the flavours and the ar aromatics of the wine. Stick to crisps, stick to pretzels, stick to whatever. But, um, yeah, nuts are bad choice. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think this is this is fresh aperitif wine picnic wine but you know it's got the acidity to handle some lighter fish fish dishes or you know um, maybe a sort of quiche or tart with some green beans or asparagus you know it's good asparagus it's just about asparagus season still isn't it so um yeah it's going really well 
Hey there, there, nice. And uh, we, in the Q and A, we have um, Sam is just kindly pointing out that the, the the card inside the tasting pack, you know, lays out which um, what foods the the wine is best drunk with. But then the question is, does the food make a difference in terms of how the wine will taste? Pasta versus curry, for example, is the question. I think you know your your note on peanuts suggests yes, yeah, some some foods have a stronger. But you know the. I guess uh, it's quite a broad, it's a good question, Sam, and it's a broad question because pasta has many sauces and facets and is it creamy and is it spicy and is it red tomato based, equally curry, I, you know, I, you know where I'm going with it. So, yeah, I think what you do is you start sometimes, a lot of times people match the food, they, they look for a wine to match the food. And sometimes it doesn't hurt to, match the food to the wine you know what we're going to drink the one thing you know for sure you're going to drink you're going to do this evening is drink that bottle of white wine that's in the fridge because you've had a good day or a tough day but you just want to crack open that bottle of wine and you can then style your dinner around that i, I don't say that as if i've got a larder full of all these things and, and a full fridge at all but you know you can so on a wine like this which is quite subtle non it isn't massively expressive in fruit um it's not exuberant perhaps like the next sauvignon blanc you can just have a more subtle dish you know um, perhaps a creamy dish but I, i'd go towards you know light as matt just said the asparagus char grilled asparagus that, that kind of thing so the intensity of the wine equals the intensity of the food or also the intensity of the condiment the the gravy the the pigs in blankets when you get onto Christmas dinner kind of thinking how strong is the flavor of the food and does it will your wine stand up to it and it, by the way before we move on the last thing to say we are all just humans <laughs> and some of us are in the wine business tasting wine for a living but we taste coffee in the morning all together some of us have one or two sugars and we have tea and we, you know so just think about trust your own palate and cook your own way and drink your own way and don't worry about the rest absolutely very subjective isn't it yeah it is yeah, absolutely no, no wrong wrong answers just some stuff i guess we've observed works well and stuff like that yeah that's right we're happy to share. so cool oh, let's yeah. let's let's move on to wine number two so give 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 number two a snip uh we've, we've mentioned new zealand uh ray's mentioned um rod and pinot gris from new zealand but of course new zealand uh, is most famous uh, for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, that kind of <clears throat> happy marriage, um, successful marriage started kind of in the 80s. Um, up until that point, Sauvignon Blanc more famous in, in France, in parts of northern France, the Loire Valley, uh, places like that. But then the, 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 the New Zealanders planted, planted uh, Sauvignon in the early 80s and it just burst onto the scene, didn't it? And it was because of the intensity of fruit. No one had really ex experienced this level of fruit intensity, these, these flavors. So this is a perfect kind of wine to, to taste together tonight, to, to, to talk a bit more about the kind of flavors that you can get. Sauvignon's an interesting variety because it's, it's all quite immediate with Sauvignon, usually. There are other, it, there are sort of, anomalies to that clearly you know why in such a big uh, com you know complex world but in general Sauvignon wears its heart on its sleeve it's 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 all punch um and I think we're always talking about different fruit flavors tonight and in general if you're talking with your friends um because generally speaking wine never tastes of wine it never tastes of grapes there are Maybe muscat tastes of grapes, doesn't it? But um, but wine basically never tastes of grapes. So we always like to explain about what we what we can taste. And so just to refresh everyone's memory, the wine we've got hopefully all got in our past now is uh, Rod East Hope's Level One Eight Five Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so New Zealand now perhaps the most uh, famous region. Uh, in, in New Zealand, so New Zealand, so North Island and the South Island, um, and a bit of sea in between. And, and most of the, the, the famous region for Sauvignon Blanc is Marlborough, and that's at the top of the South Island. So if you get yourself a map when you're 
um, later on, or I'm sure you know. But And now this one is from Hawke's Bay, which is in the south of the North Island, so a slightly different region. Um, but it's still extremely archetypal New Zealand in style. So, I mean, I, I'll ask you what you can taste in a second way, but for me, this is extremely punchy in a glass. You don't need, to, you can chill this wine down quite cold. It's super punchy. You don't need to swirl it much. And you're getting loads of fruit flavors, but they tend to be more green flavors like um, green gauge, uh, elderflower, um, gooseberry. Gooseberry is the classic, I guess. You should hopefully smell some gooseberry, some herb. I don't know. What, what else are you getting here, Ray? It's a bit riper as well, isn't it? It really is. It's, it's looking extremely well through these tasting packs and, you know, that lands then in our house through our door box. It's incredible technology altogether. But um, the comments, what I'm seeing here is, you know, you know um, nettles as an aroma popped up, mm -hmm. earlier, which was fantastic, you know, nails it. And then gooseberry is absolutely correct. And whether you, you like or dislike gooseberry, you know, but that really is what, what's coming through. It has, it's, you know, some, some Sauvignon Blancs can go perhaps sometimes too much on a herbaceous green profile where it's it can be a challenge. But as you said, the ripeness, you know, it, it still has an opulence on the palate and absolutely delicious, really singing. Um, it does. Mm. This is um, <clears throat> a hugely successful wine. Um, it's fair to say this wine is 97% rated and it just picked up a silver medal at the IWC this year. So um, a good bit of recognition for this one. Wow. I mean, R Rod is a master craftsman um, of Sauvignon Blanc, huge track record, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware of. But this, I, I, I think because it's from the North Island, it, it's a little bit more opulent. It, and um, it's sometimes the Marlborough Sauvignon Blancs uh, have a real instant appeal. But after a glass, maybe you find them a bit much sometimes. Um, that passion fruit, lots of people saying passion fruit, absolutely. That passion fruit can almost turn into sweat sometimes, dare I say. And I, I don't know whether anyone else has experienced that, but um, it can go a little bit too far. And what I, I think I see also from the chat is lots of people getting a bit more complexity here, a little bit more restraint. Um, yeah. There's a yeah. bit more going on. It, it, there's a party in your mouth and everyone's invited uh, compared to the Pinot Grigio, which was just sort of light and crisp, fresh. You know, th this is a bit more exuberant. You, you touched on one yeah. piece there, Matt, talking about, you know, it's from the North Island and therefore it's slightly riper. And, uh, and, and just for us to take a moment to sort of realize, you know, like wine is pretty much geography and booze. You know, it's it's geography with with alcohol, which is and it's fantastic and culture and travel. But I guess where we're coming from is if you look at the equator, zero degrees, uh, where it's very hot and sun rises at six and goes down at six. It's too hot to grow grapes there because of the, the excessive ripeness. It's perfect for other things. So you move around, you, you move away from the equator into the northern hemisphere and into the southern hemisphere. And it's typically 30, 50. Isn't that the, the, the appropriate mm. latitudes to, to grow grapes? So you're there yeah. looking at sort of North Africa, in the Northern Hemisphere, <clears throat> North Africa, Algeria, Sicily, and then you go upwards. And now with climate change, you're up around sort of Holland or, or you know, England, let's say around Yorkshire. Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah, Scotland and as Sweden are doing it, and Nord and Norway are doing it slowly. Yeah. Into Wine to Belgium. Yeah, different varieties. Um, so and then equally in the southern hemisphere it starts around south africa and it goes across chile argentina and so on but when you're coming into new zealand new zealand goes right down really pushes it down towards you know central otago is in the bottom of the south island and it's you know super super cold there in winters so oh, oh desert yeah. yeah so even just that movement from marlborough where you are at the top of the south island to go up a few degrees in latitude that's you know that sort of explains you're getting closer to the equator but you're still miles away and that that's the way to look at the world sometimes too hot less hot less hot less hot just right 
for winemaking. France, Napa, Napa Valley, they're all along that sort of a certain latitude around the world. Yeah. Just that it works a, well. It works well. Yeah. What great uh, vines need seasons um, generally to, 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 you know, uh, as part of their growth cycle. So the, and the equator doesn't really have seasons. It was a dry season and a hot season. And, and actually you get some extreme examples of that in Brazil, yep. near the equator, where they grow grapes and they actually have two, sometimes three vintages a year, unbelievably. So they kind of trick the vines, but that's kind of pretty extreme. And, and in general, the wine isn't quality. So yeah, mm -hmm. as, Ray, as Ray says, it's all about that latitude. And you've got to, if you look at a map, New Zealand covers it's very long and thin exactly. so from the top of the north island it's it's pretty hot and, and and sticky and then you go down to the bottom of the south and it's this cold desert so mm. there's a huge range of growing conditions um in between um but there's there's a huge amount of de demand now for hawks bay um th this region that this wine yeah. is from mm. uh for Sauvignon Blanc and um, that, that wasn't originally what it was famous for but uh, I think people really enjoying this particular style. Um, yeah. Winemaking, the, just to talk briefly about the winemaking, you know it's, it's simple stuff with Sauvignon, it's just fermented in a stainless steel tank and bottled pretty young. Um, so the winemaker doesn't have to do anything particularly um, unusual um, but what Rod starts out with here is just really, really good ripe fruit. And I think that, that's always always the best wine start out in the vineyard and, and with the quality of the, the, the grapes. Mm. Um, and then they just don't have to do much. Uh, and that's that's why I think Sauvignon is so popular. And I think, yeah, staying on the, the geography note, it's level 185, it's, it's 185 metres above sea level altitude. And so for some countries and continents that's not much but for New Zealand you know to go up that high a level that gives you a you know a cooler freshness up there and warmer days cooler nights and that gives you nice punchy vibrant fruit so yeah that was a that was a whirlwind geography lesson there so uh, before we lose the room serious job I was, uh, always hate, hated geography at school but uh, that was yeah no um so food wise mm. again you know pretty versatile yeah. it has a huge personality of its own um you can enjoy this kind of on its own as lots of people do yeah um i don't know about you for me i think seafood great you know grilled seafood they you know some oysters some clams something simple mm. how about you I like, I like the here i go more on veggie because it, it, of the the, the green slant to it you know grilled asparagus and peas fresh peas and broad beans and, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing so this is, is you know well maybe it's a cheeky glass of white wine at lunch uh, and you're having a salad you know and um, and that's what I, I i could consider that halloumi grilled it just sort of ni nice to cut through so that's it and, and everyone please you're welcome to share with us your tasting yeah. suggestions we have it in the tasting pack of course we have some food pairings but you know we're all as matt said earlier it's subjective we're all individual uh, and we know what we like to cook and we know what we do and don't want to eat um i think we should Good. move on to um wine number three let's do it yeah <clears throat> and maybe let me see uh, shall we just pause quickly actually as i say that matt to make sure we've answered everything in the q a it's nice to keep things relatively light i think covered the first question uh, is it true it's mm. better to taste in the morning yes um when matt and i travel i think so yeah you're just you have your coffee you have your eggs and then you know you drive for 45 minutes you're in a winery and you're tasting and everyone is just on the ball and everyone's sort of motivating your palate is alert and it, it's you you and, and also wine competitions matt tastes at uh, decanter world wine awards and i used to work at the international wine challenge and you know kicks off at 9 30 and and away you go so mm. yeah, that's a good question i think I, I don't know about you mate i i always find it better to taste when i'm hung uh, when i'm hungry so the, the the absolute best spot is about an hour before lunch it just being hungry adds real focus to the tasting um i, I don't know what it is uh, for me it's like if I, I when i'm hungry and i taste i and you know I get distracted. Out. Yeah, I get <laughs> and distracted. So I'm just like, okay, most of these <laughs> um, 
Anne was asking yeah. about what about honey roast cashew, uh, which is just honey roast no, cashew. You've just reminded me that I haven't had enough of them in my life, actually, Anne. So I've got to get back to that. <laughs> but uh, I'll say yes to that because I'm a big lover of it. Yeah. Uh, Lou, Matt, what glasses are you using? Is that a Riedel wine wings? Very observant. That's Anne knows her, or Lou knows her glasses. But it isn't. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll, I've got a wine wings. But what are you? What are you drinking, with there, Matt? You can you can show your wine wings in a minute. This is um this is Gabriel glass. Gabriel Gabriel glass. Um, uh, very good glass. Um, other glass brands are available. Um, but I I really like the shape of this. It's very versatile. It seems to show most styles of wine really well. It's manageable. It's not too big. It's um. But it, I tasted I tested a lot of glasses actually for for a, um, an article uh, for a magazine uh, with with a journalist and we it was an interesting exercise we tasted the same set of wines in about twenty different glasses and for for us this this came out um, top on most of on my, most of the wines but you know again it's very subjective but it is interesting if you have two different types of glass at home. Um, and you taste the same wine in that glass. Um, it is quite an eye opener how how different that wine can taste. And there are some basic principles around that which we can talk about later. Yeah, well, what are, what are uh, those? Well, is it is it the, the the delivery, like how it lands on the palate, or how can one? Why should it be different? Yeah, uh, it's right. It's going back to how you were talking about tasting at the beginning, Ray, about where your taste buds are, where you um, discern acid in the mouth. Mm. So, um, for example, if you have a Chardonnay or something, which we're going to go on to in a minute, it's a slightly less acidic, broader taste of different flavours. And, and you, for a Chardonnay, generally speaking, you want a wide rim at the top to deliver the wine across your whole mouth. Um, but if you want Sauvignon Blanc or Riesling, which has high acidity, you want to channel it down the middle so it doesn't overly accentuate the acidity. Mm -hmm. um, that's a theory anyway. And, and from what I've tasted, I don't know about you, but from what I've tasted, it's, it's quite compelling science, actually. It is. I've, I've done the same as you. have tasted the same wine in different glasses and you, you think you've seen it all and then you do that and you go, you know, that is, huh? it's a new level of fun. Uh, to, to taste i mean that's proper geeky stuff but uh um yeah no it's it's, it's worth doing but then again you know they're, 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 this is a crash course it's day one of wine and uh don't rush out to buy various glasses and just sort of it's a bit of crap and no one has that luxury do they i mean we don't all have it and we don't we don't have a cupboard full of different glasses for different wines and that's that would be a ludicrous expectation yeah. so i think the point is to find a glass kind of in the middle somewhere that just works quite well for for most wines um yeah. yeah very good well i think we will go on to the the next wine and then we'll come back to the q a but it was a good question sparked a good discussion so uh, i need a top of a wine and so we are going to south africa to um stephen and jamie devet arabella uh, if you're new to naked wines uh, welcome to the best drinking experience value for money that you'll ever come across anywhere they make outstanding just such delicious wines uh, really approachable style on, on, on every wine and all you need to do is look at their page on the website excuse me and you see on every wine it has the, the, the greatest uh, fan base following uh, of course if there's any wine that you don't like you just let us know and you get 100 percent we, we, we'll take care of it we pay you know um, refund your uh, account but you will not be disappointed. And we've worked with them since the very beginning, 13, 14 years, and they're fantastic. So they, we, you know, they've got the whole breadth of red grapes and in white grapes, of course, they've got Chenin Blanc in South Africa, but they produce a Chardonnay. And then I remember they offered us this um, Chardonnay reserve and it was about five years ago, the first time Jamie 
sent me a sample of it and it and it just tasted absolutely fantastic i think there's comments in here earlier about how chardonnay changed over the years which i'll come on to but this wine it sort of even calmed down from the first sample we had and the first wine we sold but honestly matt it was yeah five years ago in the tasting room we just so happened to be tasting merceau which is a very ex expensive and high quality chardonnay region nice. from, from from uh yeah very nice from uh, from Burgundy in France. We were tasting Chablis from Burgundy in France. And then I said, I just popped this wine in the middle. And honestly, it it stood up there with it. It, it was so impressive. Now the wine, it, it sort of, they've sort of tamed it. So it's a bit more sort of approachable. That was maybe even a bit too intense. Now it's wider appeal. So the grape is Chardonnay. And just to simplify, or to go back to the, the roots, it's not, not, not the roots of Chardonnay, but, you know, there was a, such a thing as ABC, anything but Chardonnay. And, and, and it was where, there was a time in the 80s where Chardonnay came into great popularity, mostly from American Chardonnay or Australian Chardonnay, and then into the 90s. And that style of Chardonnay was just quite, um, you know, like buttered popcorn, it was a lot of oak. It was quite ripe. It was quite heavy. And for some, it was fantastic. You know, it was, it was a new flavor and uh, people went on to it. But then people had quite enough of it. OK, and so they moved off and um, and people moved on to other great varieties, Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc and so on. But now the thing is Chardonnay, Chardonnay is only oaked if you oak it. It is a grape like any other. It grows. And actually, it's like a chameleon. It really reflects its environment. And so in, in Burgundy, in, in one place, in Merceau, it tastes like this. And in the north, in Chablis, it tastes like that. You know, they taste quite different. One is more broad and intense. Then you go to South Africa. You go to Rod in, in, in uh, New Zealand. And you go around the world. And Chardonnay just does what it tells you to do, or it does where it's, it, it performs where it grows. So what I mean is, don't be put off by the word Chardonnay. You might lean towards any wine by whether it is oaked or it is not oaked. If you're like my father, you like your Chardonnay heavily oaked and with a big bowl of peanuts, then that's the way to go. And if you're like some, you like Chardonnay, but you don't like the oaky, buttery sense, then you can look for it and you can filter by it or it'll say it on the wine page. So that's it. Chardonnay can be your new best friend. Don't shun it from anything from the past. It's up to you. It's just to look a little detail. Has this wine been oaked or not if you don't like oak? So that's the way to sort of steer your way through. And it'll say it on the back label, whether you're in a restaurant or supermarket but you know you'd be better off with us anyway so let's have a taste of it get some of the flavors and and, and welcome some of the notes in the in the q or in the chat room it's to, it's interesting just just reading some of the chat while, mm -hmm. while we're tasting but it's it's already interesting to see how divisive chardonnay is amongst people's palates and 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 really that division is not the chardonnay is it it's 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 your preference for oak aging. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit of it. I mean, this is kind of, from, I don't know about for you, this kind of sits in the middle yeah, uh, for me. So. Um, and I think that's actually the attraction of South Africa in general, is it's that stepping stone between the old world and the new world, you know? Um, I think that's it. And I, even in terms of how oak this Chardonnay is, I, I'd say, not that oak, but it, you can definitely taste it. So what you're tasting with oak is a little bit, well, woody, but um, a little bit buttery as well, which is an oak. It's just what, something they, that they do in that style. Um, but you move away from the purity of fruit, like we had in the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, which was vibrant, gooseberry and uh, passion fruit and so on. And here you're more into a feeling so, you, you know, you get a sort of a textural, it's rounded. And there was a question, I think it's in the Q&A about does white wine seem to last, why does white wine last longer in your palate? And why does that taste not go away? And why does it sit there? That's usually a sign of a good wine, but it's, it's this persistence that the acidity gives, you know, and here you can taste it. I can still taste that, that, that character. Actually, I think some of those honey glazed cashews would be just perfect with this wine right now I'm just send them over <laughs> um, send them over that's it it's um so it's that's it. it it splits the room 
it gets oakier, perhaps maybe in brass tacks from um, Scott Peterson mm. from California. He sort of dialed it up. He's done it to the extreme. And then on the other hand, you've got, um, you have Johan Kruger in South Africa, who does an unoaked Chardonnay. So like the name of the wine explicitly says none of that oak stuff, you know. So so that's why I think you guys will, will be, it'll be easy for you to navigate your way if you like it or you don't. It'll say it on the website. Wow. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing with, 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 with you, you referring back to the 80s and Australia in particular burst onto the scene with these big oaky Chardonnays and people enjoyed them for a while and then they got sick of them mm. and the pendulum swang yeah. and people and then everyone was making these super lean style okay. of Chardonnay that basically was a bit too lean and all acid and 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 now the pendulum swung back and you've got wines like um amazingly successful wines like Brass Tax which is Scott Peterson going now oh, I'm going to make a you know, full throttle Chardonnay again, and you know, customers absolutely loving it. And it's it's just, you know, it's the the, the rich uh, tapestry of, of, of particularly Chardonnay, but wine. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting how those tastes just keep going backwards and forwards. And yeah, yeah, you know, then, where the real interest is in is in the middle somewhere where the balance is. Um, I think generally, you know, you're right, yeah, exactly, and. As always, each to their own. It's subjective, but yeah, the balance is usually a, a safer ground. Um, so, what about rosé? What Shall would you drink it with, Ray? What I'd, would you drink? I drink, drink it with friends. I drink it with friends and a good podcast and uh, and, and other things like that and a piano. <laughs> it's very com it's very comforting, isn't it? Yeah. Quite lu luxurious tasting, I think. You know, um, it is. Yeah. It's indulgent. So, I guess here, related to food where whether you like this wine or not think of this wine there's other wines in a similar profile if you look on the website for ramon do sazar it's uh, from ribirio northwest spain and it's good dello treasure <clears throat> so it is you know quite tricky to remember grape names but it's a spanish white wine begins with the word ramon or a m o n so you can search for that or maybe kira might stick it in the chat room that's a wine which has equal body but you don't really detect the oak. So wine, white wines with body, you're going into a more textural feel rather than the previous Sauvignon Blanc, which is more crispy, racy. Here you're into the more, like you said, luxurious, rounded, warming. And there you go, if you're having fish, you might have a bit of a cream sauce with the fish. You're starting to sort of enrich the dish, more butter, you know it, that that's what you're hap that's what you're doing you're sort of you're increasing the mouth the roundness the yeah the, the the decadence of your dish sort of thing but again you might not be as far into steak or or heavy meats you're on white meats or white cheese like halloumi again a uh, paneer in the in the vegetarian spectrum and korma so creamy dish that's that's where you are on uh, these white wines with less acidity and more body that's what you go I'm hungry. Yeah. Yeah. The game. Awesome. So we do roses? Well, yeah, let's move on. Because <laughs> see in the chat, so some people have moved on already without us. Uh, so that's um we still talk about halloumi. <laughs> we're just waxing on about paneer cheese. <laughs> um <laughs> uh let's get into rose, the one and only rose of the night. Um <clears throat> rose. Hopefully, everyone's a fan of rosé. It'd be interesting to know how many people are into rosé and how people, just, how many people just really never drink the stuff. Um, but it's increasingly important uh, and increasingly important, not just seasonal wine, but all the way through the year. Yeah. Um, so here we've got <clears throat> a rosé from the south of France, uh, from Virgil Jolly, so from the sort of Languedoc region. And this is kind of like the heartland of, of, of Rosé. Just up the coast, you've got Provence, which is pro arguably the most famous uh, region um, for this kind of pale pink Rosé. Um, but really, there's, if you go a little bit out of Provence, uh, where Virgil is uh, growing the grapes here, you get amazing value for money um, that, that you won't get elsewhere. Um, so... Rosé, uh, does everyone know how, how rosé is made uh, like this? Um, 
Well, uh, so for rosé like this, you would use red varieties. Uh, and here Virgil's using uh, Grenache, which is a classic variety of that region, and a bit of Sansos. Um, and that's a, a thin-skinned red, red variety. So they, both varieties don't give a lot of colour, um, but um, so they're quite delicate to start with. Because um, with, with, with the majority of red grapes, um, the, the juice is actually clear, it's white, um, and, and all of the colour comes from the skin. Uh, so what Virgil's done here is he's gently pressed or maybe even just the weight of the grapes uh, in the press on their own has let the juice come out of them sort of crushed down and he's left that juice in contact with the skins for a really really short period of time so if he was making red grenache sanso blend he'd leave that juice in contact with the skins for for a long time and that would give the wine its red color and that's how what red wine's made with rosé you're making wine a bit like a, a red wine but you're 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 leaving the juice in contact with the skins for a very short period of time, maybe even just six hours, eight hours, 12 hours or something like that to give this beautiful pale pink colour. Um, so that's generally how still rosé is made. In, in sparkling, in champagne, um, actually in rosé, they, they make rosé by blending red wine and white wine, but not generally in still, still wine like this. It's made from um, letting the colour come out of the... <clears throat> skins excuse me um so as i said it's a blend of grenache sanso um this is from the absolute heartland um of, of rose country and i think virgil's done a phenomenal job here mm. it's bursting with fruit i mean it's absolutely bursting with fruit i don't know about how expressive yours is but this is there's monsters fruit but it's not it's not too sweet or um doesn't taste like sweets um, it's got lovely, delicate strawberry and slight creamy strawberry fruit. Yeah. But then on the palate, when you take it, when you're when you when you're having a sip, uh, it's 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 dry. And uh, and I guess the dryness allows you to go back for a second glass, and it also matches with food a lot better. Yeah. Um, it's uh, no, you're right. I mean, there was a comment there that said pre barbecue glugger, uh, and you know, I think that says quite a bit, but it is. It's the fact that it's a pale, dry rosé, and it is really expressive, lovely, delicate red currant fruit. So it's just the right amount of like, it, it almost feels like a white wine, but it has mm. that dotting of, of, of uh, red <coughs> currant grapes or flavors in there. We, you know, like many wines, well, like all wines on the website, we, we benchmark, we taste the wines we have that we fund from our winemakers against other wines that are in the market. And that's why you go onto any wine page and it says the angel price and above it, it says the market price. And so we taste, we buy these wines from other retailers and we taste them blind by blind. I mean, we put them in a black bag. You can't see what it is and they're poured out. And then we taste, don't know what we're tasting. We know the category we're tasting rosé from France. And then you taste and we sort of rank them. We go, are they on par? And this wine, Virgil's, always cleans the floor. And it cleans the floor with Brad and Angelina. Brangelina, alas, no longer together. So it is actually Brad and Angelina. And uh, is it Mirabel? They're, they're, they're Mirabel. Mirabel. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. how, how much I follow it. But um, yeah, we pulled that wine in and... This wine that's is pushing 20 quid, isn't it? Yeah, right? it is. It's something like 18.99, 17.99, and it's sort of like bulbous bottle. And the juice inside here, not knowing what we're tasting, honestly, it's such a fantastic wine. So Virgil, a people, there are a lot of fans for Virgil on here, whether they drink his rosé or not, but he's knocked it out of the park with this. And I think that's just where, that, that's where the authenticity and the, the uh, you know, the origin of the naked, what Naked Wines does for angels versus the marketing and i'm a big fan of brad pitt big fan of anthony jolie but really virgil's got this one you know he takes the oscar he's an expert he yeah. is an expert yeah. Wine making. yeah yeah and and as i was saying you know it's it's a slightly different part of france just offering a bit more value a bit more flexibility in terms of the kind of grapes that you can use in this um i think increasingly people yeah absolutely everyone's saying you know pre-barbecue 
quaffer actually carry it on through the barbecue because it goes great with all of the salads and the roasted veg and mm. actually you know if it's a hot day you kind of don't want to get into red wine maybe yeah. um but rosy comes also comes into its own with mm, aromatic mildly spiced food so if you're in a sort of you know uh, just mild curries i'm not talking about vindaloo's or anything like that where there's precious few wines that can can handle that kind of level of spice but when you're in the more aromatics um go for a rosé just that little bit of sweetness to it sometimes a bit of residual sugar but often just because of the ripe fruit and that just that just goes with the mildly spiced um dishes a bit of coconut a bit of thai basil that kind of thing um this, this, this rosé would really fit the bill and we and we need a we need a wine for sushi because well sushi is easily my favorite food in the world. You and I uh, we we sort of yeah. uh, death by sushi on Monday night. We were in Germany. And ate our own body weight in sushi, didn't we? <laughs> we we're at a wine fair in, in Dusseldorf in Germany, and uh, and we were with the guys from Naked USA, and you know we we tried to we tried to beat each other on how much sushi we could eat but sushi won the fight and uh, and it was an incredible spread of of sushi but I, what i mean to say is some of these wines and I, and i think this one would sit just nicely with that you you know you're you're making you know nice references to the indian spices but um you know but you know with the wasabi and the ginger it's delicious um where where is the crowd matt have they moved on to wine five or uh, is it just you and i oh, here? they've they've all <laughs> they've all gone home <laughs> it's gone. Ah, here we go so we've got a poll popped up for just great to know um i've seen loads of good good comments on the rosé but just fundamentally it's really good to have a read of uh, of you guys and and who who are the who's rosé yay and no way rosé it'd be great to cast your vote so you can click you should see the poll popped up on your screen and you should be able to click and we'll um we'll see the results in a in, in, in a in a minute or two i think i think that one you know we have you have julian faulkner coming in from provence you've benjamin may and you go and uh mm-hmm. we, we've got a beautiful breath that's just the french rosés we have but i think you know virgil at the value for money is uh it's, it's exceptional on that one i'm i'm a big fan I must drink more rosé. So uh, yeah, yeah we're going to see the poll. Here we go. Talk us through. There we go. <laughs> plenty of plenty of people going for rosé. That's great to see as we're coming into coming into the summer months. It's seventy four percent going for rosé, but you know, sadly, a twenty six percent of our customers not going for rosé at all. But there we go. Yeah, you know, don't you can't force it. You can't do all people right. all the time, and there's, there's, there's no. no harm there. Um, no. wine number five well for that yeah let's go let's keep going so um so we're into reds now so we're onto the first um red where is my number five? Oh yeah it's down here okay so we're sort of sticking in the same part of the world for wine number five and we're going to our dear beloved winemaker katie jones for this one uh with me and monsieur jones red um so give that a snip get it in your glass um i mean you know uh, hopefully we all well well aware of katie uh now she's a um one of our absolute hero uh winemakers uh in in the longer based in the village uh, in a village near in the sort of region of fitu uh down there and this is her this is a fantastic wine that she makes with her husband, Jean-Marc. Um, so it, it, we wanted to show you this wine because this introduces the concept of blending um, more than one variety. Actually, the rosé before, that's a blend. But we, I think this wine shows what more can be achieved when you start to blend varieties. So up, up until this point, we've had a Pinot Grigio, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Chardonnay. And with this wine, we start to get into, so this is Grenache, Grenache coming from Katie's own vineyards, and it's blended with Syrah uh, from Jean-Marc's vineyards. And they're, you know, they're interspersed together. Um, Jean-Marc used to, excuse me, Jean-Marc used to be the president of the, 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 the cooperative, the big, um, a big winery with lots of members down there. So he's got a, a huge um, history of grape growing in his family. 
Katie, as you know, moved down to the Longwood Dock, um, I don't know, 30 years ago um, to set up there. So um, both huge amounts of experience down there. Um, so Grenache uh, is um, quite a light, uh, so they're both traditional grapes, red grapes of the region. Uh, Grenache is quite a thin skinned variety. And if you remember, I just said that all the color and the, the, the uh, it, it, with red, all of the color and the structure comes from the skins. So you don't get huge amounts of color often from Grenache or, or, or huge flavor. Um, and then with Syrah, it's quite dark and quite thick. So you get the, this beautiful, um, yeah, just beautiful. They, they work with each other so well. So this is a wine I think is more than the sum of its parts. It, the, the Syrah and the Grenache work in harmony together to create something even more. And, and what you should get is some of the flavors and the smells of Grenache. So maybe the wild strawberry, yeah, strawberry. Uh, that kind of character, yeah. and 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 the the Shiraz, the Syrah, um, yeah. because Shiraz in Australia and Syrah in France are the same variety. Um, you'll get some of the spice, more dark fruit, but you know, blackberries, um, spice. Some people saying cigar there. Interesting. There's no oak uh, in this wine, but that kind of maybe those slightly woody characters are coming from the um some of the some of the stalks and the skins and the pips um i think that the other thing as we move mm. into uh red wine now is another element in your in your mouth and and i just want to I'm, I'm sure you guys may be somewhat familiar but just to spell it out again in red wines, as Matt was saying, with the rosé, you put the red skin grape, which has, you take it from any grapes you buy at your market or whatever, you squeeze your red grapes, it's just white juice that comes out. And as Matt says, you you literally dye the white juice by leaving the skin in contact with it for six hours. Then if you want to make a red wine, you leave it in contact for much longer. But when doing so, and when extracting, getting some of that color out, because this is a deep, this is made from pretty much the same grapes almost than Virgil's yeah. rosé. You know, but it but it That's looks right. like that. and that is just time juice plus time with the skins. So the other element that we are introducing into the organoleptic sphere, that's two big words or words I don't use enough in my life, is how do you spell that right? Uh, uh, well, that'll be in the director's cut of this evening's session, and it's uh, is tannins. So tannins, well, it's structure. It starts with structure. So here you talk about body and uh, like a framework and, and another feeling. It's not crisp and light and refreshing. It's more depth and body and roundness, and that comes from the the structure, which the skin and pips that Matt talked about. But it's it's tannins that are in the skins gives the color but it also gives a structure now tannins we'll taste it a little bit in this wine and we'll taste it more so i think in the next red wine the shiraz tannins sometimes you feel in your gums up here okay and the, some people like a sort of a good belting of tannins because you you know it's a drying this really sometimes like excessively it dries them out and that can take away from the pleasure but it, when it's done well like it is done here, it, it just, it plays its part. It plays its part in, as Matt said, the sum of all parts of it does the flavor and it does the color and it does the structure. So tannins are in red wines and tannins are not so much in white wines. And that may be why you lean, or rosé, typically tannins are not in rosé. So that might be why you go, you know, you might find red wines too dry. Some red wines, mm -hmm. lots of red wines are dry, and you might find that dryness from tannins. But some red wines, they've managed to offset that tannins, whether it's through winemaking or different techniques or a bit of sweetness. So that's the thing to keep in your mind is... Do I like tannins? Do I feel it? Does it dry my, is my mouth just like a freaking hair dryer? And, uh, and that's it. So this is nice, nice and integrated. Uh, it, it, it's important to say about tannins. Um, it, it's kind of, it depends on the situation. So if you just want to sit around with some friends having a glass of red wine, yeah, that drying structure of tannins is, is, is not, you're going to notice them and you're going to feel you know, dry red wine in your mouth. <clears throat> if you've got a rich meal or a stew or 
a big stake, like some people have said, you need tannins. They work really well with the food. If if you had a wine that did not have that structural dryness, mm. um, it would quickly become quite sickly. So it's important not to be afraid of tannins, just to sort of, they are a part of wine and they can really help in certain situations. But if you're sitting around on the sofa, it's probably not going to help. Um, yeah. So that's right. I, I think that's, uh, that, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you've got to remember wine is a, is, a, was invented to go with food yeah. fundamentally. It, it might, it might not be consumed that way now. Yeah. It may have time, been invented to, to, to not drink to just water, get drunk. full of bacteria. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was to, to not die. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But after not dying, it, it went well with the food. Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. So on seamlessly, I think we move on from not dying from uh, bacterial water to uh, Gen Vipers. Here as <laughs> I'm it. Let's just just quickly before before you do that, I just want to talk about food. It's from oh, yeah. the region, the south of France. Right. Food, food and wine go hand in hand, as we just said. Don't know about you. Uh, so the the classics of the region, um, Casale. So these big kind of quite dark bean casseroles and they're delicious but they're rich they've often got some duck maybe a pork a bit of pork in them a sausage um lots of things they're quite rich uh they've got some fat in them and this one actually handles that really well because it's got the structure that ray just talked about and it's got a bit of acidity and it goes really well if you're if you don't eat meat um it, grilled aubergines those sort of darker um yeah. root vegetables those kind of things it goes really really well and barbecues of course that's it you bring in a bit of spice like sumac and uh you know beautiful peppers and um yeah no that's it you just sort of add a little little bit more subtle spice that mediterranean feel to it um yeah uh, yeah exactly um sorry i mean need to say middle eastern so uh, you know when you go into yeah, you know, think of a Lebanese me meze and Morocco think, or Lebanon or yeah, yeah beautiful yeah. foods like that. It's a delicious wine. Beautiful, it's, so it's looking really it's good. It's delicious. It? It's it's round. It's supple. Yeah. It's oh, it's really very authentic. I think you know. Yeah. So very much um, and it, it sums up that place. It yeah. comes with a anyway with a danger warning because. You know, I, I stopped spitting that. That was delicious. I mean, that was just really. It just goes I think down. I've stopped right as well. Yeah. Um, so before we move on to the last one, so that it isn't uh, the last one, which is uh, Jen Pfeiffer's uh, Shiraz, for the Diamond Shiraz, just quickly grab two or three more questions, very quick fire through here. Um, yeah. Light here, sorry guys. You know, I was taking, I was, I was, I was milking the long summer evenings, but now it's got the better of us. So uh, we did Valerie's question. Uh, Fiona asks, if we wanted to have a go at growing grapes to make our own wine, what grape would suit our East Yorkshire temperate climate? Fiona, unless Matt has any objections, I'm not going to try and make something up here. But what, what I would say is that I, I do believe, and Matt did mention Yorkshire earlier, that there are people growing grapes in, in Yorkshire and further north. But so you might just go to the vineyard and ask them. But typically in England, the south of, south of England, which is warming up, has moved somewhat, only somewhat, away from the Germanic grape varieties, Reichensteiner, uh, Rondo, and there are some grape varieties that were developed in Germany in a, to, to, to manage the very northerly cool climate. Alas, alas or not, we are no longer very northerly cool climate. We might be northern, but we're no longer cool. We're warming up. And so, uh, yeah, you'll have some grapes like that, but you uh, safest product, because this has been recorded and I'll be called out on it, but I would go to the local vineyard and ask. But even, do you know what the, the, um, the, the what are they called? A uh, flower shop, not a flower shop. What do you call it? When you go and buy plants, a plant shop. Sorry. Garden center. Garden <laughs> Nursery. Thank you very much. A garden center, and they do grow, they do sell them there. Yeah. Um, Chelsea Flower Show. That's it. <laughs> go down south, come back up north, and and then plant it. Okay. Um, Ed yeah. Flint asks, I can see you're always spitting, but do you still get drunk if you are tasting all day? Good, fair question, Ed. Very uh, good question. Yeah. No, we don't. So we do were just you? at a wine fair. <laughs> 
I don't. We were just at a wine fair for three days there. And no. So what you do is exactly like I explained. I'll, I'll give it a, a speeded up uh, summary, but you just smell it. Already sometimes when you smell it, when we are tasting with new producers, and you want to taste lots of wines so that we can find them for you and bring them in for naked wines. Sometimes you smell and you go, chuck it away. It's like, nah, it's oxidized. It doesn't smell good. It's mm-hmm. that back to that Neanderthal do not put in mouth. Faulty. Faulty or just non-appealing. It's never going to work. So then you taste it, you put it in your mouth and you spit it out. It's enough. You don't swallow any. You put it in your mouth, you get the whole feel of it, spit it out. And then you start to picture it. It leaves a lasting flavor, which is one of the questions earlier on. So no. You taste all day after every sort of 15 or 20 at wine, you drink some water, you might get some fresh air, eat some crackers. And no, we could taste, Matt, how many wines do you taste when you're judging a decanter? Uh, 80, 100, maybe on a tough day, over 100. I, 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 you don't get drunk, but I would say um, you, you absorb some alcohol through your cheeks eventually. So, um, I, I don't know, after a long day judging, I, I don't think I'd like to step in a car, to be honest, to drive home, even spitting out. But um, I, I wouldn't say you get drunk, but y- yeah, you definitely, there's some there's some alcohol moves through your cheeks into your bloodstream, but um, it's a small amount, you spit everything out. As Ray says, you, you can smell a bunch of wines and maybe you don't like them. Um, yeah. Uh, would, would you, what you else we got? Question? Two more quick questions, then we'll, then we'll go back to the, the red. So uh, Martin asked, <clears throat> mentioned coffee and eggs before wine tasting. Is there something particular in them that helps? No, not at all. Um, I Just likes eating coffee and eggs. <laughs> that is exactly it. You know, just raised breakfast. It's, Shreddies it's, for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. You don't, no, no. It's just what whatever you consider enough to get you going in the day. And, uh, and, and that's it. That's all. So you just, you know, line the stomach and be alert and whichever way makes you do it. a run a run is a very very good way or whatever sort of a workout or whatever you like it's a very good way to get you going before tasting you are on fire you might even be a little bit too annoying for the people around you because you're a bit sort of uh, righteous and so on um a sweaty a bit sweaty. Uh, <laughs> N- N- neil asking why are so many chardonnays oaked when they taste so much better unoaked e.g chablis and other burgundies good question i think it's subjective um and i think we were, when we were talking about wh- whether you think they taste better on it um uh but i think well, as we were saying earlier um chardonnay is this amazing comedian variety that really um speaks of where it's grown and whether it's been oaked and and there are a variety of amounts of oak you can toast the barrels you can not toast the barrels you can use american oak you can use um french oak you can use slavonian oak you can you can use not oak you could use chestnut you could use a case i mean the, the, the whole world of oak is you could go down a real rabbit hole uh with that shabli is often unoaked but there are plenty of producers that oak it gently and maybe they use three five ten year old barrels and you you're not de- detecting oak but what you are getting is some extra complexity for the barrels um a lot of burgundy is oaked so um uh, you know that's just a subjective question i guess um there are some iconic wonderful styles of unoak chardonnay where the pristine fruit is really showing through shabbly um you know it's a perfect example the soil is white it's full of fossils it's full of minerals and those shabby producers just want that to shine through. And they, and if you start oaking it, you start to lose a bit of those because they're quite subtle and the oak will start to dominate those characters. So I guess it's horses for courses. It's a little bit kind of where you are and your and your philosophy. Yeah, and I think yeah, exactly that. And, it's, and, and it also comes back to, well, before there were big stainless steel tanks, though there was, you know, forests around you. So it was, always, it was a storage, it was a... It was a thing to make your wine in. So it was a, you know, uh, it had a structure and that's why you made it in there. And and that resonates and it continues. So it's just a vessel to produce it in, you know, thinking back 1700, 1800 and, and, and then you go. And then some of the greatest white wines in the world, some of the greatest Chardonnays in the world. And the reason why people are all on this call have heard of Burgundy before in their lives is because it creates some of the best Pinot Noir and some of the best Chardonnay in the world. And that's because the expression 
of Chardonnay from those sites is so powerful that actually oak is pretty bloody good at, you know, moderating it and, you know, marrying with it and, and enhancing it. And then you leave it there and a bit of oxygen gets through. So that's it. You know, as you said, horses for courses. If you're in Burgundy and you're in Merceau, Pelini Montrachet, Chassin Montrachet, they've always done it in the past because they needed a vessel and they used oak. And they continue to do so because it tastes great and it marries well with the site. So that's that's your Oak 101 Masterclass. 101. Shall Let's we do, do uh, wine number six and finish number off six. with some questions. At the that's end. a good idea. What okay. have we got here, Ray? So, so we are in Australia and we're with Jen Pfeiffer. And um, Jen has been with us since early doors. And uh, she, her father, you know, the Pfeiffer family, actually, they're in Rutherglen. So let's geographically, you've got uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide. They're Melbourne. You go north of Melbourne. You go around um, Yarra Valley, where the Santalins are. And you go further on again and you pass by the Strapo regions where, where Sam Plunkett is, Nina Stocker are, and then you go on again to Rutherglen. So Rutherglen is right up in the boonies, like it's really middle of nowhere. And I've had the great fortune of visiting New Zealand and Australia a few times, but it's always been winter. So our summer, like when the World Cup is happening here and the whole country is up and, and going for it, and I'm in, it's so cold there in the summer. Uh, I'm just wondering if I'm losing connection because things are changing, but I'll keep going. So uh, anyhow, what you have here where Jen is, she's making, it's a famous region for um, fortified sort of Swedish wines, uh, but they also have a great climate for producing really intense concentrated Shiraz. Okay, so you have Shiraz from Barossa, further south down in Adelaide, but Jen's Shiraz here, remember everything that we said earlier, about the grape, the color. So Matt talked about Grenache being a lighter skinned and Sanso being lighter skinned. Pinot Noir is a lighter skinned red grape. Shiraz is a dark skinned grape. And here you see it in the color, the density in the color in, in, and the just the whole sort of expression. And when you smell it, it smells now of, you start to get into a more uh, exuberant, riper. Here you might smell a little bit of eucalypt or mint character and then the fruit is much darker it's blackberry it's like a back blackberry pie you know you're picking back wild blackberries and then you make your home pie so it's really powerful and then on the palate uh we'll all have a sip and Matt, maybe you tell me what you've just tasted there yeah there's loads going on in that wine isn't there it's a uh, australian shiraz often like you say has this eucalypt character and obviously they lots of eucalyptus trees and they add like like so many vineyards kind of the vineyard imparts flavors of um the flora and fauna around it so you get some eucalypt characters lots of people getting licorice i i totally get a bit of licorice in there yeah. um, oh, it's, a great it's black it's it's blackberry but it's not overly sweet it's it, yeah. it, it's got some savory maybe some olive characters as well yeah. it's very sort of mediterranean i guess um yeah. and licorice yeah. is perfect in between between sweet blackberry and dry black olive so it's in the middle so you know remembering mm -hmm. that this is a crash course and some people haven't they haven't had a tasting before and here we are throwing out different words of foods that we recognize that's what it's all about that's it and all about it so feel free to make stuff up as you go along because that is all everyone does you know now matt and i do this all the time and we would write down words so if matt was to pick up my tasting note and we weren't together you can just read it we share notes electronically you go oh, okay i see i see the kind of style it is and that's all it is is it's a pointer so um so don't ever be intimidated by when people talk about you know words and fruits like this again you've got the they're a good way Sorry, they're a good way of reminding yourself of what things taste like. So you mm. just pick, if, if it doesn't matter what you taste when you taste Shiraz, but if you often taste that, then you might be able to guess it's a Shiraz in the future and, and amaze your mates, you know, just for a bit of fun. Um, yeah. So it's just about picking those little characters up. And if you see them uh, each time, then you think, oh, yeah, that's maybe a Shiraz or something like that. Um, 
that, that that's really what it's it's about. It's about reminding yourself. It's about jogging your memory, really. And also to decide, I don't like that. You know, thanks very much. Yeah. I get your licorice and I get your tapenade and your. Yeah, I don't like licorice. It's not for me. <laughs> you know, move on. So you know down. Actually, everyone talks about Shiraz, but I just don't like Shiraz. You know, it's like watching a, you know, like a, a TV show. Is like I'm just, I'm just not into it. It's all the rage. Like I have never watched Game of Thrones, and I've never watched most things. Actually, no, there you go. Miss, missing out. Well, I won't, but it's just not for me, Matt. Don't. Game of Thrones <laughs> is my licorice and Shiraz. Okay, so uh, <laughs> anyhow, so this is. You tried it. Yeah, uh, and then uh, exactly, but the. Again, it's structure. It's probably the most where we say full body and structured and sort of you know, uh, powerful wine in the lineup. And that's why we taste that at the end, because if we tasted that at the beginning, it would be too dominant on, on the other reds or even or certainly on the whites. That's the order. That Pinot Grigio would have had a tough time, wouldn't it, after this um, Shiraz? Or, yeah, it would have been a Grigio. Good palate cleanser. Okay. But, um, yes, yeah. that's, that's true. Freshen yourselves up. And um, how about that food, Ray? I mean, what would you, this, is, this can handle anything, can't it? It's a bit big, robust. Yeah, well, I, I do think there is time and space in the world for occasionally, on special occasions, well-bred beef, if that's the case, you know, but it does, it would stand up to the you know, a, a nice cut of beef. And here, what you're talking about is the, the depth of flavor, but also the tannins. And they go with the, you know, you slice into a piece of beef, the tannins sort of marry with the, the, the structure. It sort of breaks it all down and it's malleable. And, you know, it just goes well with bigger, richer, deeper meats like that. Um, on the, on the vegetarian spectrum, I guess you just sort of, you're dialing up slightly the intensity and the concentration of yeah. flavor, whether it's by spice or grill, excessive, you know, charring. And then you, this has a bit of char character to it, you know, and, and that's where, that's what you're just trying to always marry. Yeah. And is that coming from the, that's coming from the oak, right? They'll, they'll so a bit of oak in this wine. And I think when we were doing our quick oak 101, um, earlier we talked a little bit about there's a lot of things you can do to actually affect the taste of the oak in the wine um, without getting too complicated but you know it's the same in in in, in whiskey or, or in some spirits but you have this oak this wood and um, you, know, you know you have the, the open barrel that's the sort of this shape and if you want a, a more a slightly richer oaky character a more charred oak a more toasted oak character the, the keepers will literally light a fire and place the oak barrel over the fire and the, the, the fire doesn't set you know it doesn't touch the the oak but it burns the inside and you get this black coating and what that does is that adds more of those darker spicier um yeah slightly charred characters to the yeah. to the wine and with certain varieties the more robust the more extracted the darker ones like sure as it can really uh complement the, the fruit quite well yeah i think that's not it. too much you can't go too overboard no and jen's identified that that's what this wine needs um i think yeah. what we'll do is just do right. a quick vote you know if people had a, a preference uh favorite wine of the evening we might just throw wine of the out. night yeah why i that was quick wow um so nice. it, i can it, type that out <laughs> I, I, I think what we've all agreed is that, that something should have pop uh, should appear on your screen now and you just you can pick which of the wines you preferred the most and which we I think something we established right at the beginning and throughout is all of this is subjective in fact you and I Matt we might say what which wine we preferred while we're waiting but just remember that it doesn't matter what anyone else likes do what you want in life so what was your favorite Matt you think well, I think I can vote, can't I? Keep it, keep it to oh, yeah. myself. No, um, <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, oh, that's a tough one. I liked all of them a lot. I think, oh, dare I sit on the fence a little bit and say I loved um, Virgil's Rosé just for its explosion of fruit. Um, it's just instant appeal. And then I love Katie and John Mark's um, Red just for its complexity softness and just drinkability yeah how about you i will say exactly the same 
and no deviation. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, virtual, <laughs> just for the absolute joy, satisfaction, easy, and actually consistency as well. But uh, and then Katie's yeah. was just just what I needed in the evening. It just had that sort of warm. Yeah. So yeah, all all yeah. wines are created yeah. equal. Some are created more equal than others. <clears> but <throat> But that, those two were great. They were singing tonight. So the scores Ooh. and doors, let us have it, Matt. Talk us through it. What is it? Oh, well, um, coming out coming out on top is the last one of the night, Jen Pfeiffer's Shiraz. So everyone, I think, appreciating yeah. all the fruit and the concentration in that. That's a great wine. It's, you know, really perky. Um, Ooh, close second. Uh, so second place, Rod Sauvignon Blanc. So again, lots of flavors packed so on. You know, I think I think what I'm seeing here is the crowd, the customers love that intensity of flavor in, in these wines. Um, yeah, then Virgil's Rosé coming out of third, which is good. And uh, Katie's fourth. And neck and neck at the at the back are Arabella, Shard, and Sacchetto Pinot okay. Grigio. So there we go. Je Congratulations, Jen, for, for for winning the vote. Well, it's a pretty, you know, when you consider six f quite different wines, was twenty eight percent the largest number? You know, so yeah, yeah, all, yeah, all, yeah, all, very different wines. Pretty pretty balanced, yeah. you know, and so the. Yeah when they say you can't please all the people all the time you can please most of the people most of the time you know yeah, so yeah no there wasn't a standout there was there i think um just like to sort of say that we've kind of picked we like we wanted to pick six um kind of classic styles of wine and then it through the you know through the naked website you know we're great at recommending stuff you might like to try so this is a great starting point if you're new to naked in particular these are wines if you like if you've just decided what you like in this lineup of six go onto the website and and, and then pick those and see what else we recommend because that is going to really allow you to explore wine um, but stick into what you might might like and and, and mm. not kind of like offering you stuff that you're not you're not going to like too, too much so yeah um that's yeah, the power of oh yeah and when you do that and then you taste them and you rate the question is simply would you buy it again yes or no that's it yes or no. you don't have to be too cryptic or anything about it then we'll actually tell you do not buy this wine <laughs> there's actually it's probably one of the, one of the only people yeah. that say like <laughs> stop don't buy it <laughs> don't buy it because it's oaky and you don't like oaky or it's too dark share as you don't like so it'll you know that's that's quite a useful algorithm that sort of says don't buy this you might like that yeah it's very useful um well i think people are sort of do you want to whiz do you want to uh, whiz through I'd, a couple I'd more happily, questions happily do a couple of questions for sure yeah yeah what do you got there okay what have i got here um let's just whiz through do you guys do any orange wines ray do we do any orange wines well we we kind of sort of do so um yanis trupis in arcadia in greece does his mosh filero is the name of the grape anyway it's orange to sort of pinky and it's it's absolutely delicious it should be landing it usually lands around july so keep an eye out for that so it's greek and it's it's skin contact and then i was in georgia in january february or something and uh, yes, we, we are bringing in an orange wine from Georgia. It'll go into the Fine Wine Club first, and then thereafter it'll go on. Next question, Matt. Excellent. Um, I'm just picking a random a little bit here, so apologies. We may not get to all of them. We've had loads of great questions, um, but um, we've got a lot. Um, <clears throat> do reds always benefit from decanting? says ask Stuart um would wine number five um no not all reds benefit from decanting it depends on the age of the wine the style of the wine uh how it's made um it's uh difficult to give you a rule here because every wine is different um so I can't say one great variety benefits from decanting um Syrah, Shiraz often does benefit from decanting a little bit. 
Um, but it, it very much depends on how the person makes the wine. So I would say, to, first and foremost, try the wine straight out of the bottle. That's right. If you think, if you think there's just something missing, it's not it's not expressive enough. You're 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 searching for stuff. Then it could well be that the wine needs a bit of air, and you might. You don't have to have a fancy decanter as well. I often, you know, if it's middle of the week and I just think the wine needs a bit of air, I won't bother getting the decanter out. I'll literally pour it into a jug and I'll pour it straight back into the bottle. So that's like double decanting, done. And that's going to get plenty of air to it and I don't have to wash my uh, fancy decanter up at the end of the uh, end of the meal. So it, it, there's no real rule of thumb. Um, it, it kind of depends on lots of things. So just try the wine. I would say... Um, lots of people think, oh, it's a really expensive bottle. It needs decanting. Often people decant too much. And actually wine, okay. you know, particularly old wines, they, they don't benefit from decanting. They tend to fall apart. But we're not talking about super old wines necessarily. So, um, yeah, that's, that's it on decanting. Spot on. Spot on. Yeah. Um, why is it that some red wines leave a red mark around your mouth or on your teeth, Ray? You've got red teeth tonight? Mm, I do. <laughs> well, I actually went to the hygienist earlier today for the first time. She goes, she goes well, maybe we put you in for six months. And I was like, yeah, she goes, and I was like, well, I haven't been in like five years. So whatever you say. And, it, and she goes, yeah, a bit of staining. So it is the polyphenols. It is the color, the pigments that is in the the grape a bit like uh, acacia berry um I, I, I haven't said the word in so long acacia berries a c i a uh, they were all the rage oh yeah yeah, yeah. blueberry yeah they have strong polyphenols good for your heart you know and that that's the, like goji berries and that I, yeah maybe that's the kind of thing and so so that's it so they they leave it around your mouth and it, so it's the it's the pigment of the skin. Mm. That's what it is. And it's why it's yeah. not a white wine. Remember, really, Cabernet Sauvignon, red grape, you can make a white Cabernet Sauvignon if you want. It's only if you leave the pigment of the skin with the wine. Okay, mm. next question. And that's what comes off in your teeth. Your teeth are porous slightly. Good, great question from Adam here. Does tannin get less with age of the wine? Uh, yes, it does. And that is, um, I guess, traditionally, you know, wine's, Wines with tannins and structure are to give them longevity and to age. I guess for wine to age successfully, uh, if you want to put wine away in your cellar, the wine needs three things. It needs some acidity, it needs fruit, and it needs tannin. And those are the three things that are going to help that wine age. And the tannin is the also the colour in the wine. And over time, that drops out um, because... I won't go into the science of it, actually. It's a bit, but anyway, it drops out. Um, it comes out of the, the solution. It's not dissolved anymore. It falls to the bottom of the bottle. That's why if you've all often got an old bottle, you decant it, not necessarily to get the air to it, but just to take the liquid off of all of the solids. Um, if you've got a bottle of vintage port, then it's old. You know, there'll be a lot of solids at the bottom. They are the tannins literally dropping out of the wine. So the wine becomes softer over time. And that's why you sort of there's an optimum drinking window for some sort of finer wines or wines, wines built to age. Um, yeah. OK, um, Tim, uh, uh, Tim and Josie ask, um, I've noticed wine alcohol content is much higher than it used to be. Is it really increasing over time or is this an illusion with new world wines? Could it be improved? um through yield and better yeast tolerances Ooh. very good <laughs> big question late night big question and the, the answer is yes alcohols are increasing over time and we won't shy away from the truth it is because of climate change it is things are warming up and and right so it can be moderated and through yield and, and vineyard management and so the canopy, how much you protect the grape with the leaves, sort of protect it in the vineyard. And then also with when you pick the grapes and you bring them in, as you said, as you suggested, and perhaps you are from a technical lab yourself. But yes, Sounds like it. Yeah, different yeast strains are have been cultured to manage uh, and, you know, to, to create, you know, to, to deliver wines to complete the fermentation. But um 
I was tasting wines last week uh, from Bordeaux and they were 15.5% alcohol. And you just go, hmm, that is, no, no, yeah, it, they, they were out of balance. They just wouldn't work. They weren't good enough because of the balance. Remember, we were talking about the mouthfeel, the tannin and the acidity. This, you feel the alcohol. So it can be moderated. But yes, alcohols are increasing. We have just launched 9% alcohol, low alcohol, Ooh. really nice, yeah. fresh white wine. Of from Oscar. It's called Radiente. Maybe Kira, you could share a link to that in the, in the chat. But it's so delicious. Perfect for these warm evenings, 9%. And then don't get carried away because it's so gluggable. What else have you got there, Matt? I'm just having a look. Um, <clears throat> Um, how did you fellas get into this line of work? <laughs> oh, a police oh. officer wouldn't ask us that. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> That's a long time? story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long, not very interesting story, to be honest. <laughs> no, but I, I guess <laughs> accident. One, I, I think one thing that I realise what we both have, Matt, is what what keeps us in this line of work is the people and that is you know us here but our winemakers and any winemakers matt before you were with naked the, the wine culture is amazing it's farming as i said at the beginning it's just growing grapes which will have good years and bad years and then it's eating food and it's sitting around a table so that's what keeps us in the job i would say it's yeah it's, people. it's yeah it's it's absolutely right it's a fantastic it's full of friendly people um make you know doing just yeah farmers people that are focused on quality i just I, that's always what what excites me it's it's kind of exploring the world and finding people that uh, you know are, are so obsessed with with just pushing as hard as they can on terms yeah. of quality and have that glint in their eye you know and yeah. it's just a it's a very friendly trade and, uh, yeah. and it's, it goes with fine eating and drinking yeah what's not to like what's yeah. not to like um yeah We've, we've um, both, you, have you got one more classic and then we could wrap it and let people, uh, you know, we don't want to, we won't be responsible for yeah, the we should. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Um, oof, what's it going to be? This is going to be, got to be good, hasn't it? Um, well, uh, what does it mean when people say the wine has got the legs? Right. Matt. I think we should take this one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> it's something I don't actually pay much attention to at all. I have to wow. admit, but it's it's something I I was introduced to when I was starting out in the trade as well. Um, the the legs are what 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 you're referring to is when you swirl the wine round and you look at the wine in the glass and and, and you sort of hold it back vertical and the wine sort of creeps back down the glass and it, it does that quite slowly and, and and basically that's a bit related to the alcohol level in the wine but it's it's actually the glycerol level which is it's related to the alcohol but it's basically how viscous the wine is so it's not water it's got lots of other things in it um so you'd say it's very crudely you'd say it's thicker than water um so the, the liquid holds onto the glass and it drips down a bit a bit uh a bit slower but people seem to have got become a bit hung up on legs right. i think in, in, yeah. in wine and and it doesn't actually mean a lot but basically it gives you a good idea of the alcohol content so with it with the, with the gen five as sure as you know you probably you might notice some legs on there because um you know it's i, I don't know what the alcohol content is but i'm guessing it's 14 and a half or something like that and it's um and you know that 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 would give it a good clue if you drank something like from gascony or the, the the Pinot Grigio, which was probably 11 and a half, 12 percent. It's it's yeah. you're not going to see the legs. Um, but really, wine is it's, it's about how well well made the wine is. So even if it's a high alcohol, it's it, if it's well made, you, you're not going to detect it. It's not going to feel out of balance, and you just kind of go with it, really. Yeah. I, Anything you, to add? No, you said it. I think hopefully you might have taken all of you may have taken greater anecdotes more useful information from this evening which you can watch back on for bits and pieces than the legs on the glass piece because it is a thing that is commented on a lot but 
the more important stuff is what does it smell like? What does it taste like? What are the tannins? How fresh is it? You know, that's that's the stuff you can actually is is um, sensory. And and I know, yeah, I, I also don't pay too much attention to the legs. On no. no. Well, there you go. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, cool. Well, guys, it, 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 so many of you joined. I hope you've had fun. Yeah, right at the beginning. So many stayed on right till this point. We're, we're very grateful. Uh, the wines did, that they carried us through the evening. But then they all look great, honestly. And um, uh, so we have another one, Matt. I think you are hosting another tasting pack session when's that matt Ooh, uh yeah guys um so 29th of uh june that's a wednesday uh, so not our, our normal day um details haven't been released yet so a little sneak preview for you guys who are still on the call um i will be joined um by one of my favorite friends katie jones so we tasted one of her wines uh, tonight um but i'm thrilled that she's going to join me for an in-depth um, tasting of, of six of her favorite wines including some newbies and some classics um so uh it should be should be really great oh yeah beauty two legends on one call very good um <laughs> great great um good okay well uh, thank you for joining and uh, so we'll have a few more of these tasting packs sessions going forward they'll be advertised on on the website you'll probably get an email as well that one hasn't yet been advertised so don't you don't need to go looking for it yet it'll probably pop up in a couple of weeks um but otherwise thank you for your time with us uh i love it you know it's just good you know why are you into wine there are nice people there's nice wine and then you get to talk about it as i said it's geography and booze you know yeah good stuff that's great Great. Have a good evening, Matt. See you. Uh, see you in. Uh, yeah. See you in Carcassonne tomorrow. <laughs> oh, mate. Hope you've had a good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good night. Bye, bye, bye. everyone. Bye, bye.